see you in the room and um, to see you get up and walk out during the film is also pretty cool when you're on your own stage. Very well, scary. I waited until I last seen. Yes, I saw that. I know. Yeah. Um, well, um, thanks again. And I, I just I have to ask you about um, about the adaptation from from the book um, about the dialogue in the movie. I haven't read the book, but the dialogue is so fantastic. Do you know how much of that? Well, uh, William Hannah's book was almost all narrative, very little dialogue. Extraordinarily uh, unknown uh, Southern author, fabulous. So look up his name and. And, uh, and what's the name again? Oh, I've got it written down. Willingham, I believe it was. Anyhow, uh, so this script was written by the woman in the straw hat in the very last scene who was talking to Shelley, um, Joan Tewksbury. And, uh, and one other person, but Joan did the, the bulk of it. However, what you see in the movie is largely improvised, um, beginning right at the beginning of the picture, an extraordinary pan shot down the tracks and the boat coming up and the two of us coming up the hill, <clears throat> all that banter leading to the taxi cab scene was not done as written, the joke was there, uh, but that was about it. I'd forgotten how much of it was, uh, was in pro um, Now, when Altman did that, uh, it wasn't traditional, like, name a subject in a town and a, a flower and, and we'll do a skit about it. But he would gather you around in conversation and say, well, you know, we're going to do this scene. And just let's read it. And you'd read it and he'd say, well, what if? And he'd throw out a couple of ideas. And then you would go away and then things would gestate. So by the time you got to do it, you had this information inside you. You had the emotional nature of the scene or the characters. And it would just kind of effortlessly come out. So how naturally did that come to you when you first started working with Alton on MASH and you were doing stage work? How, how long did it take for the two of you to, to get to that point where you were comfortable with that? Uh, about five minutes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'd never done any improvisation at all. and. <laughs> But he created such a wonderful environment, beginning with the ability he had to make you feel that you were the only actor who, was, who should ever be playing this part. That gave you great confidence. And then um, the informal nature. You never felt threatened or that you had to perform. In fact, you didn't like performance. Um, it was all very low key. So how many takes were you doing then? Well, that, a lot of that depended. That whole opening sequence, was done twice. That was it. Wow. We did that whole sequence in an hour and a half. But scenes that have a lot of dialogue, how would those come together? Well, so I'll give you an example of the uh, the second dinner scene at the table when they find out there's a price on their head. Mm -hmm. We spent about uh, three hours rehearsing that because the camera moves, especially, were quite intricate, and um, and then we shot it. We got it on the first take. And in those days with film, you always did an extra one for protection. And then they moved into the close-ups. But I mean, the master was obtained with me in a quick amount of time. So we did a tremendous number of page-wise. That was like five or six pages. And it was done in a remarkably short amount of time. That way. So in your whole body of work, what does this film mean to you? Well, this is an interesting piece for me because uh, in, in terms of, it was the biggest part that I had with Altman. Uh, sadly, it was the last. I, I didn't know that at the time, um, due to many circumstances. But personally, as an actor, uh, this show, this movie got extraordinary reviews, especially by Pauline Kael, who was sort of the team of film critics in that period of the 70s. And I got a review that was extraordinary. Never since Humphrey Bogart had such latent violence been seen on the screen. <laughs> and I thought, man, I'm in. <laughs> well, of course, the picture opened, and then it was audiences like this, so we were close in a week in terms of uh, box office. And indeed, it is a very daring film. It's extraordinarily pastoral and, and does not, uh, it's relentless in its, its pace which Altman created. It was the one disagreement we had. I felt that from the time that 
gang finds out that there is a price on their heads, one of dead or alive, that there should be an urgency that propels the rest of the movie. Um, now, since I had no choice in this matter whatsoever, these were talks over drinks. Um, but he differed very, very greatly. And of course, what you see is, is the results, yes. I'd like to take some audience questions. I'm sure we have some, so let's just raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, well, he's going right in front. I will love. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. yes, the good doctor here. Okay. Yes. Oh. Did you want to say something? Yes, I have a question. Okay. We've been going to Robert Altman's films our whole life, and it seems that in many of his films, he takes the genre and turns it upside down. And watching this again, it's been a long time since I've seen it straight through. Yes. It seems to me you have to make a comparison to Bonnie and Clyde, which you went out a few years earlier. But that's an audience response. In the making of his films, did he discuss with the cast that he had in mind other films that he wanted to stand apart from and maybe at the same time comment on? Thank you. We were not aware of it. All we were aware of was that we had to do the best storytelling possible. And, and that's what he gave us, so that's what we approached. Um, he admired Bonnie and Clyde, uh, but he didn't want to do Bonnie and Clyde with them. He, he uh, well, what's that, who was that other one directed with him? The violence was extraordinary. Peckinpah. Peckinpah, Sam Peckinpah, I love Peckinpah's papers. But he felt Sam did those better than he would have. So um, he liked, in this particular case, taking, he was fascinated with, he saw it in the cave of Mrs. Miller, he's fascinated with uh, unsavory types and traditions, like in the Western, that the fact that they weren't honorable at all, they shouldn't be in the back, it's a lot safer that way, you know, <laughs> to get rid of somebody. Um, but with this particular picture, I, I think the closest he came to wanting to imitate anything or to follow was the tradition of the Southern writer, where you can smell the earth in the books. You can, you, uh, you have characters that you don't see anywhere else. Chickamaw was a fascinating character that way. He was supposed to be a half-breed, an Indian, uh, which was not uncommon. Uh, and he, um, Tito, suddenly, you don't, you don't see people like that. And then he wanted to combine <coughs> that scale of violence that Chickamaw had to the practicality of T-Dub to the naivete of Keith's character, Bowie, uh, to tell this extraordinary story. Um, I'm going to wean away a little bit from your question because the answer basically was no, he never did that. Well, the one exception was he was fascinated by Orson Welles' use of the camera and what's the black and white horror film? Uh, thank you, Dr. Evil. And he tried to make this opening shot an Orson Welles type shot. And then, of course, he repeated it later on with an extraordinary thing in the player that goes on for 10 minutes and I think did break the record of an uninterrupted movie um, shot. Um, so he had some things like that, but that was more ego than. <laughs> than anything 